Berman, um, outgoing head of the Cancer Research Institute, incoming chair of pathology and molecular medicine at Queens. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce you today to Gottfried Surdahl, whose name I'm not sure I can pronounce properly, but he's a nevertheless a, a, a treasured colleague. He's a what can I tell you about him? He's a loyal citizen of southern Sweden, uh, specifically the Lund Malmo area across the bridge from Copenhagen, Denmark. He's been at Lund University since 2008, where he progressed through undergraduate and graduate school, uh, postdoctoral fellow and faculty. He's now an associate professor of translational medicine in the Division of Urologic Research at Lund. Um, so together with his PhD supervisor, Matthias Hoagland, and a talented multidisciplinary team, uh, Gottfried's, re Gottfried's research pioneered molecular subtyping in bladder cancer. So this is um, something along the lines of luminal and basal subtypes in breast cancer, but you'll see it uh, certainly has its own share of complications. Um, nevertheless, this is a program of research that has yielded what's called the Lund Taxonomy of Bladder Cancer, the, the first complete taxonomy of molecular subtypes. And it's contributed quite a bit to our understanding of the disease. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Gottfried through research collaborations over the last four years. And I find that he has a remarkable depth of knowledge in all things bladder cancer. And he's extraordinarily generous with his time with his data and his thoughts. Um, and he's a careful and passionate scientist. Today, he'll discuss his work in bladder cancer subtyping, as well as its clinical and biologic implications. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Gottfried to our lecture series. I'm sure uh, you'll enjoy his presentation. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Gottfried. Well, thank you very much, David. It's, uh, that was an amazing introduction and uh, I'm just humbled and grateful to have been invited here and to hear those words coming from, um, from you in particular is very, it, it really warms my heart. And um, I wanna just before I start also thank uh, the organizers, your, your Cancer Institute at Queens and um, to have been selected for your seminar series. Um, I mean, needless to say, it would have been really nice to be there in person, but, um, and meet, because there are several esteemed bladder cancer researchers at your institute. Uh, but I, uh, I hope that I will be able to come back and visit you in the future. So the title of my so talk too. today, yeah. <laughs> The title of my talk today is Development and Application of the Lund Taxonomy for Classification of Urothelial Cancer. And uh, this picture here is the main university building of Lund University, which uh, I think is at its most beautiful in, uh, in the spring and early summer when the magnolia trees are in bloom, which you can see here. So um, I'll, I'll get right to it. Um, I will start with a brief introduction about the bladder. Um, I think maybe most of you know it, but I still think that this is necessary uh, for everyone to follow what's, what's coming next. So I'll just, skip, I'll just take this very quickly. The urinary bladder, as you know, it functions to store uh, the urine produced by the kidneys and urine enters through the two ureters and leaves through the urethra. So um, the, the urinary bladder in cross-section, as you can see here below, uh, it consists of several tissue layers. So um, the inner lining of the bladder consists of the urothelium, which is an epithelial tissue that I'll describe next. And under there is a basal membrane and a submucosal stroma layer, and um, uh, underneath that, several uh, muscle layers. So um, the urothelium, this, this, uh, this surface of the in lining of the bladder is the tissue where, where nearly all bladder tumors originate from. So this is a non-squamous but stratified epithelium. So it's classified as a transitional type of epithelium. And it's lining not only the bladder but also the ureters and part of the urethra as well. And the main function of this uh, of this tissue 
is to serve as a waterproof barrier so that urine does not leak back into the body. And uh, if you look down on this multilayered epithelium, you can see that it consists of differentiated cells called umbrella cells, which are the ones that are stained in, in brown in this picture. Um, and underneath, there are several layers of intermediate cells. And then you have basal cells, which are located closest to the basement membrane, which I have indicated here in a dotted red line. And the, the progenitors of the cells of the urethelium are thought to be reside here in, this, in the most basal layer. So I will also just say a few words about um, bladder cancer. Uh, first of all, who gets bladder cancer? So this is data from Sweden. Uh, first of all, the incidence of bladder cancer compared to other tumor types. It is in Sweden currently, the, depending a little bit on how you count, the seventh most uh, incident uh, tumor type after prostate cancer, breast cancer, and non-melanoma skin cancers, uh, colon cancer, melanoma, and lung cancer. After that follows bladder and um, uh, the rest of the urinary tract. And the risk factors for developing bladder cancer is um, a male sex, which is uh, the male um, preponderance, predominance in bladder cancer is in a ratio of about three to one between males and females. And uh, another risk factor is old age. So bladder cancer uh, almost exclusively occurs in, in people over 60 years. And uh, smoking accounts for about half of the cases, meaning that this disease would be cut in half if everyone stopped smoking. And um, there are no st really strong uh, hereditary signals, um, although this is not completely investigated yet. Um, there is, uh, however, a link to Lynch syndrome, uh, which is um, uh, the, the congenital mutations or loss of uh, these, these three genes, which cause tumors in, in some organs, including the uh, bladder and the upper urinary tract. And uh, you're also at risk for bladder cancer if you have worked um, for a long part of your life in, in these, uh, some of these occupations. So um, it is presumed that the chemicals that uh, are involved in these occupations are, uh, are uh, causative agents for bladder cancer. And this top graph here shows the incidence of uh, bladder cancer in Sweden for men and for women from uh, 1970 up to 2010. And as you can see, this, this, this disease has gone up in men and less so in women, but overall it, uh, both, the, uh, both the raw incidence and the age standardized incidence has been, has been rising, but plateaued, uh, I would say recently. And here is the, again, the, what I mentioned before, the age and sex distribution. So you have women here, the, the age distribution of them and the age distribution of men on the right. And as you can see, the most, the vast majority of cases are here in, in patients between 70 and 85 years of age. So how does bladder cancer develop? I mentioned it starts in the urethelium and it starts as an, as an early lesion, which can be either uh, seen as a carcinoma in situ or as an early papillary lesion uh, of the stage TA. And when, when the cancer progresses, the first step is to invade through, break through the basal membrane and invade into the submucosal stroma. That's, that, uh, when that has happened, the tumors are categorized as T1. And collectively, these three stages are termed non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And these are, these are treated very differently from, from tumors that, that come next. So the next step is to invade into the deep muscle of the bladder. And this, uh, this is stages T2, T3, and then also T4 when, when the tumor um, goes beyond the bladder itself. And these T2 and up are categorized as muscle invasive bladder cancer. These are only about 20 to 30% of, of all the uh, bladder cancer cases. But if you look here, I have indicated an approximate survival figure for each of these stage categories. 
And you can see that while stage is very, while survival is very good for the non-muscle invasive stages, it is uh, very bad um, for uh, for muscle invasive disease, where um, um, where something along the lines of half of the patients um, die of their disease eventually, depending of of course on on the treatment that, that they were able to receive. So speaking of treatment, I should also mention how bladder cancer is treated. So we have again this division between non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive stages and uh, surgery is the, the main treatment of bladder cancer. So early tumors are removed uh, with resection uh, through the urethra and whereas muscle invasive tumors are usually treated with radical cystectomy meaning that you remove the entire bladder of the patient. And um, the other main uh, treatment modalities of bladder cancer is um, intravesical chemotherapy has a role, but mainly I would say um, this treatment, Bacillus calmet grain, which is uh, also called BCG. And this is an intravesical treatment that activates the patient's immune response to eradicate the tumor. This is given for high-risk non-muscle invasive cases to prevent progression to, to these life-threatening muscle invasive stages. And once a patient pre pre presents with these life-threatening stages, uh, there are some systemic therapies in use. And the main one is this platinum-based uh, combination chemotherapy. And um, um, I will talk a little bit more about this later. It, it improved, it has been shown to improve survival, but uh, the improvement is rather modest. And I should also mention when I talk about treatment that um, in more recent years, there have been um, uh, approval of some targeted agents uh, and immune checkpoint inhibitors for later lines of therapy. So um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are active in bladder cancer, and so have so are these compounds here. This is an inhibitor of uh, FGFR3 uh, receptor, which is activated in many cases of bladder cancer. And there are also some antibody drug conjugates that are recently um, available, targeting these two tumor antigens and delivering a chemotherapy drug to, to uh, cells that express these, these targets on the cell surface. But all in all, this is the way treatment looks for bladder cancer, but there are no molecular predictive tests that are being used, uh, as there are in many other uh, tumors. The one exception for this could be that you could say that PDL1 staining and uh, FGFR3 mutation could select you for these later lines of therapy. But for the main treatment modalities, they are given to a patient uh, regardless of, of the molecular status of their, of their cancer. So this is the situation we, we were in when we really started to research uh, bladder cancer molecular subtypes. And this was around 2012, a little bit before then, when we started really systematically to perform a gene expression analysis on as many tumors as we could really. And uh, eventually this, this work um, resulted in a, in a study that I will try to describe here. This was published in 2012. It was a series of 308 tumors. So we had approximately 100 each of, uh, of TA, these very early tumors, and the stroma invasive T1 tumors and the muscle invasive tumors with stages T2 and above. So it really covered the whole spectrum of bladder cancer. And we performed microarray-based gene expression analysis of all these 308 tumors. And we, we um, used an iterative hierarchical clustering method to group these by the similarity of their gene expression profiles. And we came up with this seven group solution, which, and these seven groups, we just termed them MS, and then a number to indicate the molecular subtype. And uh, you could see here that we knew that already here from the beginning that these subtypes had a certain relationship to each other and a certain relationship to tumor stage as well. 
so after we we looked more in detail uh, which i will show in the next slide we actually also gave names to these um, to these ms clusters and we termed these first two clusters that were rather similar so we grouped them together we termed them Eurobasal A. Later on, we changed that to Eurothelial like. And then these clusters were termed genomically unstable. And there was an infiltrated cluster consisting mainly of, of, of stroma and immune cell signals. Now there was a cluster termed Euro B and another cluster termed SCC like or squamous cell carcinoma like. And uh, in addition to performing this in our own data, we we downloaded and analyzed in exactly the same way with clustering the three data sets that were largest that were available at the time and we could see that while we could not reach the same granularity in these data sets we could validate that these these groups were not just something we saw in our own data so this was the first instance of a molecular subtype classification of bladder cancer and uh, we also performed, of course, a more extensive biological characterization of these subtypes, including demonstrating where immune cells were, were, were present, to what degree, where uh, early versus late cell cycle signatures were active, and uh, certain cytokeratin patterns, um, as well as actually mutations. So we performed Sanger sequencing on, on the three of the more frequently mutated genes in bladder cancer. Uh, showing that with a different method than that uh, um, FGFR3 mutations tend to occur over here in the Euro subtype, whereas uh, P53 mutations occur in the genomically unstable and um, um, basal SEC-like subtypes. And there were also some interesting patterns regarding, regarding um, the tyrosine kinase receptors and the FGFR3 signaling module and some cell adhesion molecules. So um, um, with, this, uh, with this work, uh, I think uh, we came out a little bit ahead of many other groups, but, uh, uh, but what was evident uh, shortly thereafter was that in the coming five years, I would say between 2012 and up to 17, there were many, many um, papers and analysis that performed similar uh, things as we have done. And um, uh, interestingly, I mean, almost all of these uh, analysis by groups in the US and a group in Denmark and a group in France and actually a group in, in Canada as well, the, the Vancouver group led by Peter Black and uh, published a, a, a gene expression classifier in 2017. Um, all of these, all of these uh, analyses were based on their own data sets, which, and each data set is of course slightly different from each other, but uh, some of these analyses also had a little bit slightly different angle to it. So um, I must say that um, the fact that we are where we are today, which I will show you later, we reach, all of these groups reach a consensus on this tumor subtyping, um, that, is, um, that is due to each of these uh, works contributing its own kind of, uh, um, its own perspective to bladder cancer subtyping. And each of these works has, has a value in its own, uh, although it was very difficult for a period of time to see exactly how these relate to each other. So uh, we actually, we tried to do that uh, in an early analysis in 2015 already. Uh, we were able to show with four of these classification systems, including our own, that uh, there was actually not any disagreement to speak of between these classifiers. It was just that the, the quality of the data and the size of the cohort analyzed meant that uh, these operated at different levels of resolution. So, for example, the UNC, the University of North Carolina classifier by Billy Kim's group in North Carolina divided cases into just the basal and the luminal category from the beginning. And they have since expanded their classifier, but uh, 
this was the original one. And then the MD, MD Anderson categorization had a third group, and then the TCJ had four groups initially, and we had more groups. But what we could show was that these actually just captured this, this tree structure that I showed you in the beginning at, at different levels. So um, the disagreement was kind of um, um, not, uh, not true, actually. The, the classifiers, to a large extent, agreed with each other. So um, most of these papers were actually produced solely on muscle invasive disease. So we realized really quickly after, after all of these analyses came out that we, we also needed to update our taxonomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer. So what we did was we, we brought out a new set of, of patients. And this time we took a consecutive series of patients who received radical cystectomy. This means there are mainly muscle invasive cases. And we performed quite extensive immunophenotyping based on TMAs, um, based on the knowledge that we had acquired at the time about bladder cancer. So here is a long list of all the antibodies that we ended up using in this study. And we also performed a microarray-based uh, gene expression profiling. And what's interesting with this study, uh, what was difficult with it as well, was that we could have taken just the gene expression clusters as they are, and that would be a, a molecular classification in itself, but it didn't really match perfectly with the immunophenotyping that we had done. So what we realized was that some of these immunophenotypes, they diverged into different clusters, and conversely, some of these clusters converged into um, uh, into uh, the, different, the different phenotypes. So what we did in the end was we decided to to uh, keep these apart, and we we sh we um, produce these uh, these IHC panels that you can use to classify bladder cancer uh, with immunohistochemistry, and then we took these gene expression clusters and we sort of corrected these using the immunohistochemistry data. So uh, I will show you in a minute how how we did that. It involves a adjusting for the, the infiltrated uh, subtype of tumors, which is consists of biopsies where almost all the content is of stromal origin rather than tumor cells. So uh, what we did actually was we took this cohort and we, we then took both the RNA clustering and the, in the immunophenotyping, and we, we sort of reordered this using, using both data levels. And uh, uh, by doing so, we got rid of this entire cluster, which was, which was just an infiltrated cluster. And we also split up some of these other clusters by, uh, for example, whether the basal-like tumors were heavily infiltrated or not. And this large clusters were split um, because we realized that only half of these were neuroendocrine-like and half of these were consisted of tumors of the genomically unstable subtype. So this is all a bit complex, but once we reordered all of these uh, all of these cases based on both data levels, we were able to build um, an RNA-based classifier. Uh, so we built this type of classifier, the nearest centroid classifier, and we showed that it worked rather well uh, when applied um, in internal cross-validation. So. Uh, the next step, of course, was to show that this, this worked in, in a different data set. So what we did next was we applied this to the TCJ cohort, this classifier that we had just done. So, so note here, and this is the important part, that this is not just a gene expression classifier, right? But this is an RNA classifier that captures both the the uh, cluster membership based on RNA analysis, but also the sort of immunophenotype of the cancer cells themselves, which is of course independent of the amount of stroma that is, that is present in, in the biopsy. So that's sort of the trick to, to make this classifier IHC corrected. Um, and what we, we could show 
was that when we applied this classifier to the TCGA data sets and later on, we could show that it, it still worked really well and it really picked out the, the um, for example, the basal-like subtype uh, according to, to known definitions. And it also separated on the luminal-like side here where we have two main subtypes called urothelia-like and genomically unstable. They were also separated really nicely on these um, genes here that we know separate them, uh, including FGFR3, cycling D1, RB1, and um, CDKN2A. So in addition to these gene expression patterns splitting up very, very nicely in, in TCGA, um, we also saw that I think to a larger extent than uh, with just the pure RNA subtypes of the TCGA, it actually split up both the mutations and uh, copy number alterations, um, at least the most relevant ones um, in the expected way, meaning that FGFR3 mutations were enriched in, in, these sub, in the Euro subtypes A and B over here, uh, whereas RB1 and TP53 mutations were enriched in the genomically unstable subtype comparatively. The same was true in the expected directions for copy number alterations. And um, I'm just highlighting here um, genomic loss of uh, CDKN2A on 9P and um, um, homozygous and hemizygous losses at the RB1 locus, which occur mainly in this subtype over here. So we showed actually both with gene expression data and with genomic data in TCJ that this, this uh, classification strategy was, was rather successful. So um, next, uh, and kind of similar to this in parallel, there was a project started by, um, uh, by Paco Real, a professor uh, in uh, Madrid in Spain. And he started this already in 2015. And he, he talked to everyone, all the um, PIs of the studies that I showed you before. And he got everyone uh, on board to, to this consensus molecular subtypes project. So this focused on muscle invasive bladder cancer. And um, it took a lot, of, a lot of work, primarily from two bioinformaticians at uh, Institut Curie in, in France. Um, Aurélie Camoun and Aurélien de Renier. And uh, so what they did was they compiled all the data that was available for bladder cancer. And they cross compared all these classifiers and showed how they overlapped with each other. And then they produced this consensus classification consisting of these six classes. And this was published eventually in, in uh, 2020. So it took five years from, from Paco starting this project to the eventual publication. And um, yeah, so we were very happy with the consensus project, not just because everyone was on board, but uh, we realized that this will create an important uh, sort of central reference point for, for uh, molecular classification. And we were also very happy because it showed that these six groups that they describe in detail in this paper, uh, we recognized all of these, um, of course, uh, alterations and mechanisms and uh, in gene expression signatures that were described in all of these. Um, because we, we knew that it was fairly obvious that the consensus subtypes overlapped very well with the learned taxonomy. And I would say that this is the main overlap. So it's almost one to one uh, with, the, with this exception over here. And another exception is the stroma rich, right? So because we, 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 do not, we do not have in the learned taxonomy an infiltrated subtype because we have, as I mentioned before, trained our classifier to identify just the subtype of the, of the cancer cells themselves. So this stroma rich subtype here is actually in learned tax classified as any of the other uh, molecular subtypes, but it also includes all the um, all the tumors that, in our classification, are classified as mesenchymal-like, uh, meaning that, I mean, they show a profile that is very similar to stroma, but um, 
and this is the cancer cells that express this, um, which I actually really need the immunostaining to, to show, I think. So anyway, we were very happy with this consensus because it's, it's sort of a common, common ground for, for bladder cancer researchers. But of course, I mean, um, yeah, I should say the difference here is that our IHC corrected phenotypes um, do not, do not uh, have a, a stroma rich or an infiltrated group. And we're currently using a single sample classifier to, to classify tumors. And this can then add continuous scores on stromal and immune content, as well as proliferation, actually. So um, the fact that we got rid of, of, um, of stroma and immune content in the classification itself does not mean that we don't consider it important. Uh, rather the opposite, we consider it important. And there, that's why the primarily reason why we, we choose to keep this apart as something that can be analyzed on its own um, and uh, in relation to the molecular subtypes of the cancer cells. So I just saw this online the other day and I, I, it struck me how relevant this was in this situation. So this is the problem with the consensus subtypes, right? We were all in this situation when Paco started. There were many competing standards and we all thought it was ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's cases. Yeah, yeah. And then soon we are in the situation where we have just one plus you know, a, a system to deal with. So um, I thought of this and uh, how it really relates to molecular subtype classifiers. But um, still, I think the consensus project is important because it's different. It, and everyone is now forced to include the consensus classification in, in their work. And it makes it so that we can all relate to the work that, that uh, we do, each using also our own uh, specialized systems. So, um, so what now, uh, at this point, with the consensus and the learned taxonomy developed, I, I, I dare to say that molecular classification of muscle invasive bladder cancer is uh, completed, actually. So there's still a lot of work to do in the non-muscle invasive tumors where much less has been done and less data exists. Um, but, um, but for MIBC, I would say that it's done. And what's, what I think is good about this whole process is that until this point, it has been purely basic science. So uh, these studies have just been driven by maximizing the differences between these groups and minimizing the variation within these groups in terms of uh, expression of RNA in proteins. So, um, the fact that this has not been developed to be uh, a clinical tool, that actually means that as clinical praxis may change in the future, uh, these subtypes will very likely stay the same. And I think they will actually be more or less what we will have for the future in bladder cancer, not changing to any reasonable uh, extent. So is the work over then? No, of course not. The work is not done. It has only begun, actually. Uh, thankfully, I should say, because uh, I'm not out of work. But um, And the reason for this is this one question here, which is um, sort of a gargantuan question for, for the future for bladder cancer. And that is, how can molecular subtypes be useful, uh, both in clinic and in research? So I, I again thought of an analogy and I just thought of this Contiki raft that was built to, to travel from, from Chile to the Polynesian islands a very long time ago. And uh, you can see it as this. We have, we, this was a magnificent construction and we have built this now and we have shown that it, it can float and it works and it, it's got sails and all the necessary parts. But um, we still have no idea if it will get us to where we want to go and if it will eventually be useful for patients or not. I don't think anyone has proven that. And um, you may hear people claim that that, that has been proven, but uh, I have not yet seen the hard data that actually proves prospectively validated that, that this affects um, uh, 
some clinical praxis. But of course, that is where we, we want to go. So uh, next, uh, I will try to describe some of the unpublished data from our group, which is where we have started to tackle uh, this type of question of uh, ap application of this method. And first of all, uh, I would like to uh, describe a project that I completed recently, but that isn't published yet. And that involves uh, testing uh, the, the association of molecular subtypes to response uh, to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is one of the um, pillars of, of treatment of bladder cancer um, when it comes to muscle invasive disease. And it works like this. So a patient comes in with symptom and uh, the diagnosis of, um, of muscle invasive disease is, is done. Um, and uh, after that, patient is planned for a radical cystectomy, but before radical cystectomy, uh, the patient goes through three to four cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This is usually either gemcitabine plus cisplatin or this combination treatment called MVAC, which also includes cisplatin. They're comparable in efficacy. So what happens then is that when the bladder is removed, the tumor has either responded or not responded to this neoadjuvant treatment. And depending on the response status here, whether there is uh, no cancer left in the bladder or whether there is just a little or a lot, then the, that to a large extent determines the patient's prognosis. And the mean absolute benefit of, of this neoadjuvant treatment is only about five to 7% in absolute percentage points for five years survival. But of course, for patients who, who, who achieve a, a complete pathologic response, uh, the benefit is, uh, can be, for that patient, the benefit can be the difference between life and death, very likely. And then after that, patients are, are followed, of course, clinically. So in light of this, we, we collected, we performed a retrospective um, um, cohort study where we collected um, a consecutive cohort of all the patients that in the southern parts of Sweden, actually, that, that received uh, this neoadjuvant uh, cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And we also uh, used uh, that we had previously available a, a sort of reference cohort of patients who got radical cystectomy, meaning they received the surgery, but without any prior chemotherapy. And we excluded patients here based on a lot of uh, different criteria, which I'm not going to go through, but eventually we ended up with um, 124 patients who we had done molecular profiling on and who had um, gotten neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And this other arm was 186 patients. So uh, the subtyping performed in this cohort, uh, actually it matched pretty well the subtype proportions we were, we were expecting. So we subtyped this both by RNA expression profiling and also by immunohistochemistry with the method I showed you before. And um, we could show that, you know, we, we discovered the exact gene expression profiles that we anticipated to find. And we had no problems classifying this material. And also with immunohistochemistry, we saw these uh, pretty clear uh, immunophenotypes that allowed us to classify the, the tumors very well. So obviously we wanted to, we were very curious to see how this related to, to pathologic response. And uh, what we saw was that um, three of these subtypes had a rather low pathologic response rate here of around 20 to 25%. But one subtype, the genomically unstable uh, subtype of, of the luminal type of cancer actually stood out and had a much uh, higher proportion with a complete pathologic response. Uh, so this was an encouraging finding as, as this was actually a significant difference between this group and this group here with the lowest um, with the lowest proportion. And, and whether this is clinically an, enough or not, I, I dare not say that. Uh, before, before then, I think we need to validate this, this findings in, 
in other materials and um, but uh, at least there is seems to be a significant difference in in the the uh, association to response here and when we looked at in the in this reference cohort which did not get chemotherapy as expected very few patients actually responded meaning that they were tumor free um, the, the few ones that that were tumor free were must have been so from from the diagnostic resection alone so because there was no chemotherapy in these patients uh, but these background rates we argue did not uh, um, um, did not fully explain this this difference seen over here but response of course is not uh, the only important thing in the end it is the survival of these patients that matters so um, when we stratify them by survival uh, we could see the same thing uh, it was going in the same direction which is of course um, really nice to see and the genomically unstable subtype of the luminal type uh, again did very well whereas the basal squamous subtype did, did poorly along with this neuroendocrine like subtype which we know has a has a very poor prognosis so uh, we we observed this and we also observed the expected pattern of of outcome for for clinical stage groups so clinical stage is a very as you can see here a very strong predictor of outcome after radical cystectomy and this was particularly true here in the in the chemotherapy treated uh, treated cohort so um and again this difference between the these two subtypes were were significant statistically so when we looked at this exact same analysis in the reference cohort where patients did not get any chemotherapy, we saw that uh, while there were diff small differences in, in outcome, the difference between the blue and the red line were not nearly as strong as in the chemotherapy treated cohort. Although the blue line here is, is located above the red, red line. And curiously, we also observed a much uh, less robust association between clinical stage and um, cancer-specific survival than we had seen in the chemotherapy-treated cohort. And the reason for this, uh, I'm not, not uh, very sure of, but um, I think it, it's, it was an interesting observation nonetheless. So since, since, since clinical stage is, a, is such, a, such a good predictor of outcome after, um, after cystectomy, it is of course important to conduct a multivariable survival analysis here. And so we did, and when it seems that, you know, the information contained in the clinical T stage categories uh, did not, uh, it did not overlap so much with information contained in the molecular subtypes. So actually, this this um, difference between the genomically unstable subtype and the basal squamous, which I put as a reference in this analysis, was was significant uh, even after adjusting for clinical T stage. And I think this is a requirement if this is going to to ever become useful that it shows additional information that is not captured by clinical stage. And a, a similar survival analysis in the reference cohort showed that the molecular subtypes were not significant, but rather three other variables were significant, and that was age and uh, lymphovascular invasion and presence of carcinoma in situ. So it seems that these two um, clinical situations um, um, are, are somehow very, very different whether that is due to the retrospective nature of this study and how these cohorts were selected, how pa which patients that got chemotherapy in this period and which didn't, I don't know. But um, I think it, it's, it shows interesting data and it shows um, something that we need to, to study further. And uh, furthermore, we of course used this this data set that we had of 124 cases to, to dig a little bit deeper in the gene expression data. So first of all, we pulled out these signatures that, that we know and have studied well before, just to check that it looks okay and 
the tumors classified as basal squamous here, for example, they show the expected patterns of, of this basal squamous signature um, seen here. So basically this looked as we expected with relationship to the subtypes, but here I also ordered within each subtype, I ordered them by pathologic response. So we have the responders to the left and the non-responders to the right. So if any of these signatures were connected to response, we would be able to see it in these heat maps, but uh, you don't. So that to me indicates that beyond molecular subtypes where this blue subtype responded uh, to a large, larger degree than this red subtype, there is nothing in these, um, in these biological signatures from bladder cancer in general that, uh, that seems strongly associated with with the response to chemotherapy. And we, of course, we also performed a differential expression analysis of these genes. And we actually discovered surprisingly few genes that, that survived uh, um, multiple testing uh, adjustments. Uh, and it was actually only a handful of genes that we identified in this data set as, as downregulated in, in responders. So these are potential resistance genes, and, or these four were upregulated in responders, so uh, responsiveness genes. We also performed the GSEA analysis, uh, pre-ranked with um, the hallmark and curated cancer uh, pathways and signatures. And we could show that there, while there was a significant, statistically significant enrichment of um, of the cell cycle and proliferation signatures in the response responsive category, um, that that the effect size of that signature was not uh, very good. It would not have been very useful to predict um, to predict response. And there were a handful of other signatures also going in the positive direction here. Some immune signatures and some signatures relating to oxidative phosphorylation and urethelial differentiation. Whereas the signatures that were downregulated in responders, meaning sort of resistance related signatures were, rela were related with tumor microenvironment and invasion or keratinization or epidermal growth factor signaling, which was uh, a little bit interesting to us. And uh, what we chose to do next was we just, and I just want to highlight that we went further with, with this top candidate here, which was the gene that was most strongly differentially expressed uh, between responders and non-responders in our entire data set. So this gene is called SPP1. It codes for osteopontin, which is an extracellular protein that can be produced by by both cancers, epithelial cancers, and by the by stromal cells. So first of all, we show that this, this gene was higher expressed in the base cell-like subtype that responded poorly. So this could be the explanation for, for what's going on in this gene. But when we then took each of the five main molecular subtype and we split it up in the responders and the non-responders, we saw this striking pattern where, where um, SPP1 expression was linked to non-response in each of the subtypes here, except, but not at all, in this green subtype, the urethelial-like. So there seemed to be a subtype dependency on how this particular gene, the expression of this particular gene, correlated with response. So we thought this was really interesting. and. Um, so we looked in one other available data set, which was produced by the Danish group in Aarhus. And this is the Tauber et al. publication from last year. And they had 96 cases with gene expression data available online. We classified these cases. And when we did the same thing there, we showed that once again here, if anything, it goes in the other direction, right? But there's no difference between the responders and non-responders in the subtypes. Whereas in three of the other subtypes, we, we observe the same, the same pattern. So um, this compelled us to move forward with this, with this uh, interesting uh, 
protein called osteopontin or SPP1. So we, we um, applied immunostaining and we looked, it took quite a lot to find an, an, an antibody with this that worked well for this protein. Uh, but I will show you data later that we, we actually did manage to do that. So we stained, we stained the TMAs in this cohort with an anti-SPP1, anti-osteopontin antibody. And we show, this showed that actually the cancer cells can produce this protein, but the stromal cells can also, in some of the cases, produce this protein. And in those cases, the cancer cells do not necessarily produce it. And then there are cases that are completely negative. And uh, as a control here, we use the human kidney, which is supposed to express this protein in the, the proximal tubules only. And uh, as a control also, we, uh, we plotted, I, plot, I show here the relative RNA expression versus the tumor score that we derived from these immunostainings. And this is the score ex when expressed by the tumor cells. And this is the same, but the score when expressed by the stromal cells. So in both cases, you can see that there is a, a, a positive correlation between what's happening at the RNA and IHC level which I think means that you can probably trust this antibody that it stains actually this, this protein. So next we use this IHC score and we looked whether that too could predict response in a subtype specific manner as we'd shown for the RNA data. So uh, actually, basically, yes, it did. So when we looked at when we looked at all the subtypes and we looked at the tumor score, stroma score or combined, there was nothing there. And also within the urothelial, like the green subtype earlier, there was no significant difference. But when we looked in the other subtypes, and this is now with the immunostaining data, uh, we again showed a significant association in, in the right direction, meaning that a high expression of this protein in the non urothelial like subtypes it means uh, it is associated with a resistance or a, a lower probability of achieving a pathologic complete response. So um, what do we make out of this study? What is the value of molecular subtypes in um, in, in neoadjuvant setting? So what I would say based on this data, if these data hold up in, in future validation, I would say that the molecular subtypes themselves may serve as a biomarker. And the reason why I can claim this is that the, the best responding subtype, GU, versus the worst responding subtype um, had a clinical stage adjusted odds ratio of 3.5 for a pathologic complete response. And in the same direction, there was um, cancer, um, and a hazard ratio of 0.29 for cancer-specific survival. And um, I will leave it up to clinicians to decide whether these differences are strong enough and whether the groups capture, capture the patients uh, uh, well enough that, that this can, can eventually be clinically useful. But um, at least the signals picked up here are statistically quite robust and going in the same direction with multiple uh, um, multiple analysis levels. But the interesting part, which I kind of exemplified with this as uh, osteopontin um, analysis, is that apart from being the biomarker itself, the molecular subtypes may provide the context for biomarkers. And this is actually what I really believe in for the future because the molecular subtypes of bladder cancer, they are so vastly different from each other that it seems to me very unlikely that we will find biomarkers that work across the board in bladder cancer. It just seems more likely that, that you will have uh, markers that operate in, in one or several of the molecular subtypes, as we showed was the case for, for osteopontin at the RNA and uh, protein levels. So uh, obviously this type of studies is nothing without uh, validation. So, and I think 
you have to plan this ahead when you do this type of study that it is not enough to stop here and just start pursuing something else. So I'll just finish with three slides showing how we intend to move forward with these findings. And the first is this. So this is a study that has been going on since 2019, which is called Euroscan Seek. So this draws from several hospitals in southern Sweden, in these places here, and uh, biopsies from bladder cancer patients are sent uh, centrally to Lund, where RNA is extracted. And this is all, none of that is done by us. This is all done by facilities. And RNA sequencing of these cases are, are done. And we have uh, actually produced this uh, subtype classification pipeline, which automatically in real time performs molecular subtype classification on these tumors. So this has collected uh, up until today over 600 bladder tumors, and it is an ongoing effort, which, um, which will of course allow us to validate any clinical associations that we have found in, in previous work in this, uh, in this prospective um, uh, observational cohort. So this is going to be very valuable. And just to mention how, how the subtyping is done in this, in this setting. So um, there is actually a pipeline for molecular grading. So there's an unbiased um, estimation of the, of the tumor grade. And then molecular subtyping is performed with two different rule-based single sample classification methods. And when both of these agree, then the tumor gets a molecular subtype. And uh, all of that is captured in this type of a, a report output. So in this case, you could see it's a basal squamous-like subtype with a high degree of confidence here. So we will, uh, when we have enough uh, patients in this, in this uh, prospective observation of cohort to validate the, the findings in the neoadjuvant cohort, we will be able to do that. And that will not take, take too long, I don't think. And additionally, so most of this work is done by Pontus Eriksson, who's a bioinformatician in our group. But additionally, Karina Bernardo, which, which is another, which is an experimentalist in our group, she is developing a subtype specific model systems. And in particular, she is developing PDX lines of the different molecular subtypes, which she use in mice, and also to, to derive tumor organoid models. And these experimental model systems will be very valuable when it comes to finding the mechanism that may, that may be driving the link between, for example, osteopontin and chemotherapy response in some subtypes, but not in the other subtypes. So again, I think all of this has to be done in a subtype specific manner. It's not, a, it's not enough to just take a bladder cancer cell line and just hope that it's, it works. I don't, I don't think so. And the hypotheses here for Karin are in vivo evolution and plasticity, metastasis and stability of, of the tumor phenotype in the various different anatomic sites and metastases. So uh, just to wrap up now, I would like to acknowledge, of course, uh, this would not, all this work would not have been possible if it were not for this uh, amazing team of colleagues that I have here in Lund. So just to highlight Matthias, uh, who's my, uh, my mentor for my PhD, and uh, as well as uh, Pontus Eriksson and Noor, who are the current bioinformaticians in the group, Karina, who I just mentioned, and Frederik Liebe, who is head of the clinical team at the urology in Malmö. And also I should mention that this chemotherapy uh, neoadjuvant cohort study was done in collaboration with Anders Ulen and Karin Holmsten, who provided a lot of input and a lot of the clinical samples from Stockholm as well in this study. And of course, gene expression data was generated at these facilities and funding came from several different funding sources. Without uh, these, the research would not have been possible. So uh, thank you for listening. And maybe there's time for some questions. I see that it's taken me an hour to get here. Thank you, Godfrey. Um...
questions? Oh, we have a hand up. 